Amen. So I get the privilege this morning of starting a new series in the book, uh, the book of Luke is how we're going to start it, but uh, the series is on the resurrection as a whole. And I was excited when Pastor Charles and I began discussing this and we were thinking about what do we follow up the last series uh, with and, and where do we want to go? And he, he proposed the resurrection and I jumped on that immediately. I, I was very excited. I've often lamented how Christmas gets started two, three months before December. And it goes into January or February before the lights and the music finally stop. Not that I have a problem with Christmas, and I actually was one of the ones that pushed the Christmas music into January this year during our services. I think we can, we can celebrate that as well. So I've got no problem with Christmas, but what about Resurrection Sunday? Right? It gets one day. Well, what's that about? And some people say, oh, no, 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 we've got Lent. It gets 40 days. And I say, no, 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 no. Lent is 40 days leading to the crucifixion. That, again, I have no problem with the crucifixion. The Good Friday service is one of my favorite ones to plan. I love that contemplation of the cross and really deeply thinking about the love of God in the cross of Christ. I love those services. But what about Resurrection Sunday? One Sunday. You get one day and it's over. We move on. <laughs> the hope offered there, the joy offered there, the, the grace extended there. One Sunday. No. Now, I don't know if uh, Charles got sick of hearing me complaining about this or, or, <laughs> or what happened here, but it, it is, it is a, a grace to be able to do six weeks on the resurrection. For the next six weeks, we're going to look at how it affected those that first heard it in the Gospels. We're going to look at how it moved and changed and grew among those believers in the book of Acts. I'm going to really in-depth look at it from 1 Corinthians 15 later on in the series. We really have an opportunity these next six, six weeks to really explore all that there is in the resurrection. And that may either be a blessing in that we... Well, blessing for Pastor Charles is he stockpiles the next six years of sermons for Easter. <laughs> or, or it's a curse. He's going to come up next Easter and have nothing to say because we covered it all here. We'll find out next Easter <laughs> which one of those is true. But that's where we're looking today. We're going to start that resurrection series. We're going to be in Luke 24. Uh, if you're using the Pew Bibles, that's page 749. Now, some of you may know I'm a history guy. I, I enjoy history. History. I'm one of those odd few that loves reading uh, the uh, writings of old dead people. That's, that's something I enjoy. And for those in here, those few of you in here that enjoy that as well, you know when you read history, there's always an angle. Right? You never get the, the full, complete story. It's not possible, right? You, you can't have everything about any one event written in one book or one lecture or even in a series of lectures. A historian has to pick certain events that highlight the point he's trying to make, that point in a certain direction. And that's not a bad thing, it's just a reality. You can't cover everything in any one event. I can't cover the Great Awakening here, the religious revivals of the 18th and 19th century, in one sermon. I can't. But I can point you in a direction that, that I believe that will give you clarity and a grander view of that time period. And Luke is a master historian. He's gathered up and interviewed people. He's taken the time to bring together all of the accounts of Jesus' life that he could find, in, and he puts them in the gospel. But he doesn't put every account in the gospel. He puts certain ones to lead in a certain direction to make a certain point. The Holy Spirit works through him to guide him and direct him to put down what will further the message he's trying to say. John says the same thing when he writes his gospel. John 20, 20, 21, 25 says, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. This is the reality of history writing. We can't cover it all, but what drives us forward? What gives clarity? What is the important pieces? So guided by the Holy Spirit, Luke gives us the picture of the resurrection in chapter 24. Not a complete picture of everything that happened that day, but a, a resurrection account that moves a message forward. So as we look at Luke 24, we want to think about, we want to ask, 
why are these events placed here? What is he trying to tell us by picking these accounts? We know that day was full of people talking about and interacting. Now, there's an account of Peter meeting Jesus that we never see in any of the Gospels. So there's other things going on, but why did Luke pick these things here? And the chapter is broken up into three main sections. And they largely, they repeat the same elements with three different groups of people. And what these elements tell us about the resurrection and the message that overlays each of these stories is that God uses the gospel as proclaimed in his scriptures to bring about changed lives. We see three groups of disciples, lives changed in much the same way, in much the same process in this section of Luke. What Luke is telling us is the resurrection is a message of movement. It grows and extends. It never stops. It continues to spread through the lives of those changed by its truth. It started and it goes forth, never ending. This movement is what we have captured for us in these three accounts. The first occurs in Luke 24, so 749 in your pew Bibles, verses 1 through 12. This is that passage uh, where the women who were there at the crucifixion now take some spices on the Sunday morning, the first day of the week. They take some spices to go and finish the anointing for burial that kind of had a rush job done on Friday. But they get to the tomb and the stone is rolled away. The guards that were there are gone and instead there's angels standing in the doorway. They're confused. And the text says they stand around wondering, what does this mean? And those angels gently rebuke the women. They gently say, hey, you, you should know what this means. The angels in Luke 24, verses 5 through 7 say, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. The angels ask these women, why are you confused? Didn't Jesus himself tell you this is the way things were going to happen? Why does his return to life come as a surprise to you? This is the exact message he's proclaimed to you since the very beginning of his ministry among you. It's this message that they heard from Jesus' own lips that God brings to their remembrance at this time and it forever changes them. God's word lays dormant in their hearts until awakened by God and they're granted remembrance and faith. The reality is the, never, the gospel never returns void. It may sit dormant in your heart for years as sin and temptation ravage you. But in an instant, God could bring a remembrance and faith. And that message brings life. God can bring to remembrance the gospel truth and resurrect our lives, just as his resurrection opened the eyes of these women on this day. No amount of doubt can stand in the way of the hand of God. And the word we hear preached today may be the saving grace that transforms our lives tomorrow. It's the way his word works. It always works. The text says the women remembered Jesus' words and they immediately, their response is to immediately run off to tell the other disciples and to proclaim, the Lord is resurrected. His promises are true and the message has been he's been explaining to us these last three years are all true. He's alive. They believe and so they tell. And those gathered in the upper room, those disciples that were, that were gathered and scared, hiding in the upper room, they hear the woman's account and they respond. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. The disciples reject the women's testimony altogether. They come in excited. The Lord is resurrected. We saw angels who told us. And they write them off. That's nonsense. They reject it altogether. That is, except for Peter. And if, as we read John's account, John ran off too and says, uh, 
Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself, what happened? This is that pattern I was speaking of. This is the exact pattern we're going to see throughout the book of Luke, or the chap- Luke 24. Luke displays this confusion and disbelief in the women. What happened? Then on the appearance of the angels, the women are reminded of the words of Christ. They're reminded of the gospel that was spoken when he was with them. And they're convinced that he is alive. God opens their minds to receive his word. This fills them with such joy that they immediately rush to the others to tell them the good news. And the response, no, I don't think so. You guys are nuts. Not interested in that song. (laughs) Move along. All but Peter and John outright just reject it. And even when they get to the tomb, they see the empty tomb. They see the burial clothes folded neatly and lying there. And they wonder, what does this mean? Didn't the women just tell you what this means? Didn't Jesus, before he died, tell you what this means? No, they're wondering, what does this mean? These are the disciples. These are those that walked hand in hand with Jesus, that ate with Jesus, that slept with Jesus, that spent years listening to Jesus tell them this exact message. I want you to think about that reality for a minute. Three years hearing this message, and they see it before them, and they wonder, what does this mean? Or, I mean, that's the best case scenario. The rest of them said, nah, you guys are nuts. Now, before we get too hard on the disciples, I want you to realize also, I mean, think about how hard that message would have been. You you spent years walking with him. You thought he was the savior of the world, the son of God come down to redeem Israel, and you saw him die. You saw him buried in that grave. Hold up in the tomb anyway. You knew there was... Roman guards, armed Roman guards around that tomb. No one's getting through armed Roman guards. He is dead. And now some women claim there are no soldiers. The tomb is empty. And there's no body. That's a hard message. Even for the disciples, that is a hard message message. And and how much harder for the unbelieving world we live in today? Right? We shouldn't be surprised at the response we get from the gospel. It is a hard message. As we tell our family and our friends and our co-workers and those we meet on the street, we tell them about the resurrection and life. That's a hard message. So you're telling me you really believe that Jesus rose from the dead. He, he was dead, and he wasn't dead. Really, this guy 2,000 years ago left the grave and is still living today. That's what you want me to believe. Yes. That's the truth. That's the gospel message we preach. That's the reality of the situation. That is a hard message. That is what we believe. And that's a hard message for those we encounter today. But this is the message, the only message that brings life. This is the truth. It's the only message we have been given to proclaim. It's the only message the women were given to proclaim. And what did they do? They found such joy when they knew it was true. They ran off. Some will question it. Some will outright reject it. But some will accept it. And they will be changed by it. The gospel never changes, but it changes people. The message these women were given is the same message we are given. We should be patient with those we preach it to. But we should be persistent in preaching it. 
It is the message of life. Jesus told us he was living among us and he was going to die and take the punishment for the sins of the world upon himself. And then after three days, he was going to rise again. He told us this is true and then he did it. This is the message of life. This is the progress of the resurrection among us. Rebirth and eternal life that changes people and keeps moving, changing more and more as the message goes forth. That's the message, the gospel. And Jesus' own lips. And that's where the sex, second section opens up. Another group of disciples going down the road, Luke 24, 13, and begins this way. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened here these days? What things, he asked. As the disciples are walking along, talking about the crucifixion, talking about all that has occurred in the last day, their hope in the Messiah that they just saw killed, as they're discussing the nonsense of these women who say that the tomb is empty and Jesus is raised, Jesus himself walks up. But the text says they are kept from recognizing. The sovereign hand of God has kept them from seeing who this is. And the text does not say they don't recognize him. It says very clearly they, he was kept. They were kept from recognizing him. Jesus doesn't want to reveal his identity quite yet. He wants to engage them in conversation. So Jesus walks up and he asks, what are you discussing? The response of these uh, disciples is to stand still in sadness. Just as the women before encounter that empty tomb and, and wonder with disbelief, these two disciples discuss the events of the day in doubt and in sadness. And Cleopas comes back to the stranger. What do you mean, we're, what are we talking about? It's all anybody's talking about. Where have you been these last two days? Now, that's my own paraphrase. Of, <laughs> but that's the tone you read in this. Where are you from, man? You've never heard these things? And I find it amusing every time I read it. Uh, Jesus replies, What things? <laughs> Just all nonchalant. What things? He knows more about the things they're talking about than they know about the things they're talking about. And his response, What things? I love that. But he's drawing them into conversation. And so they reply, in verse 19, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people, the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Jesus gets them to lay it all on the table. What's on your mind? What's really going on? All that's been concerning them is laid out. All their doubt and their fear is just displayed before them. They'd hoped Jesus would redeem Israel. They were amazed at the claims of these women, but they could not get a grip on what was actually happening. So Jesus tells them exactly what was happening. He said to them in verse 25, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with the Mo book of Moses... And all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning him. Don't miss that. That is clear rebuke by Jesus. How foolish you are and slow of heart to believe. 
It's again the same comment by the angels to the women. Don't you, didn't you know this was going to happen? Jesus said it would. And now Jesus himself, what do you mean you're sad and confused? Don't be so foolish. This is exactly what the scriptures have said all along. So Jesus begins in the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, and he goes through passage by passage through the prophets and explains to them from the scriptures all those passages that point to him that said this is the way it was going to happen. This is the way it had to happen. Jesus is telling them this should have not been a surprise to you. The same scriptures read in the temple and throughout your synagogues every single week said this was going to happen. They speak of me, he says. Others have said it before, but I'm, I must agree entirely. This must have been the most amazing Bible study that's ever taken place. Jesus himself walking you through passage by passage, explaining how these texts speak of him. Speak of this event specifically, his glorious resurrection. And we can just imagine what texts were included there. Now Luke doesn't tell us, and I think he's got a reason for not telling us what passages he kept, but Luke doesn't tell us what passages Jesus walked through. And we can imagine, maybe, I, I think he probably had to go to Genesis 3.15, right? That very first gospel presentation where we get a picture of, of God condemning the serpent, and that's that very first picture of Jesus is going to overcome death and overcome the devil. Genesis 3.15 reads, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will will strike his heel. Jesus crushes the power of Satan and redeems mankind. That's all right there in Genesis 3.15. We imagine, I imagine he had to cover Isaiah 53. Right? That's that clearest picture in the Old Testament of what it really meant for the suffering servant to die for us. It's, it's speaking of the forgiveness of the cross thousands of years before it happened. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 says, Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. That's clarity of the cross well before the cross ever existed. Did he go into Psalm 22 with these men? That same psalm he quotes from the cross when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's crying out. Referencing Psalm 22. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare at and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. A passage I can tell you that he certainly covered was Psalm 16. And I can say that because both Peter and Paul quoted in the book of Acts as proof of the resurrection, as proof that the scriptures speak of resurrection. Psalm 16.10 says, You will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. We don't have to go into all the passages that throughout the Old Testament that speak of Jesus. There's far too many to cover in one setting, but the reality is the scriptures speak of Jesus. And if you want to know what was preached to these men, look at the book of Acts. Read the sermons by the apostles that followed after this. They're filled with references of the gospel from the Old Testament. Dr. Philip Ryken in his commentary on this passage says that very same thing when he writes, although it is true that we do not have the full text of Jesus' Easter sermon in the Gospel of Luke, there is a sense in which the notes from that sermon are scattered throughout the New Testament for it is the same message that the apostles always preached. The resurrection fulfills the promises of Scripture and the Scriptures are those which point to Christ and the grace offered in the Gospel. The gospel, the message of, of his grace moves and validates the scriptures, moves through them, and the promises of God are found in them and change people. And these are the same scriptures we hold in our hands today. This is the power Jesus points to. This is the text Jesus references. 
We have the very promises of God for forgiveness of sins and eternal life in this book. And the power of the Holy Spirit within us to proclaim it to all that will hear. The resurrection continues to change lives today on the message of those that were changed by it. It grows and expands and moves. So continuing in Luke, the seven-mile journey with these men is almost up. But after this lesson on Scripture, the two men do not want Jesus to leave. They want this stranger to come with them. We are not done hearing about this. This is too amazing. Come and eat with us. So verse 28 As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Their eyes were opened. Just as they've been kept from seeing Jesus Christ, now the hand of God is lifted and they saw who he truly was and he disappears. And when he left them, their minds immediately went to the scriptures immediately to that discussion they had had along the road. Their hearts burned within them as they heard him preach from the scriptures. The message of Christ and the word of God was transforming them as they walked. And when he opened their eyes to see, they knew these were the very words of God. They knew he was Jesus. They knew he was the Lord, the Savior. And immediately, verse 33 Immediately they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord is risen and he has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. More witnesses of Jesus, more witnesses to the resurrection. Even Peter himself comes and says, I have seen the Lord. And when these two men join in the upper room, They add their testimony to the mix. He talked with us. He opened the scriptures to us. We get to the final group in Luke's text today. They're standing around. They're hearing these testimonies. The testimony of Peter himself. The testimony of the women. The testimony of these men on the road. The witness is growing. It has the strength of Peter proclaiming the resurrection. And we continue reading in Luke 24. And we see... The claims of these people do not bring faith. The message returns with the excitement, but it doesn't bring faith. Verse 36, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and they were frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Look, my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate in their presence. The testimony of the women brought unbelief. Ah, that's nonsense. The gospel proclaimed by the disciples on the road to Emmaus was discussed along with Peter's own testimony. And yet when he appears among them, they doubt. He has to physically prove that it's him. He stands among them and he displays his hands and his feet, the wounds that are still there, and he eats among them. This is a physical resurrection. And this is a passage that's used by apologists and those that defend the face to say, you know, this is a physical resurrection. He said himself he's got flesh and bones. He ate among them. He had them touch him. His body was real flesh and blood. But I don't think that's the only reason Luca keeps this account in there. As important as defending the faith is, this is not the only reason. What we see here is another declaration of doubt and disbelief on the part of these witnesses to the events. Even as Jesus stands before them, even as he displays his wounds and eats with them, the text says they still did not believe. 
That is until verse 44. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. The disbelief changes once he opens their minds to see, to understand the scriptures. He preaches the gospel to them again. And the message contained in scriptures of his resurrection, of his life for them. From Genesis to Malachi, the Old Testament message, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. This is that consistent testimony of scripture. It's the message we've all been given as witnesses to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the message that transforms lives and opens eyes and minds today. This is where the passage has been leading all along. The witnesses found in the scripture, the witnesses of those whose lives have been changed by Christ are to take that message to all nations. The resurrection empowers us to spread the gospel of hope to all who will hear. In all three accounts, there's the witness of the word of God, the proclamation of the gospel, and the supernatural opening of the memory, of the eyes, of the mind, of God doing his work through the message preached. We have the scriptures. We have the witness, the work of God in our own lives. We've witnessed the work of God in lives around us. And we are to tell everyone who is willing to hear of the glory of God and all that we've seen of him. From there, we are to trust God to open eyes, open minds, open hearts. Not so much concerned with the response but concerned with the message and allow God to be God and do what we were called to do, proclaim his hope, his grace, his truth. We are witnesses. He is the Savior. Charles Spurgeon makes this comment about the resurrection. He says, Brethren, there is a divine necessity that Christ should die and an equally imperative must that he should rise again from the dead but there is an equally absolute necessity that Jesus should be preached to every creature under heaven. It behooves to be so. Who then will linger? Let us each one, according to his ability and opportunity, tell to all around us the story of forgiveness of sin through the mediator's sacrifice to as many as confess their sin and forsake it, We are bidden to preach repentance of sin and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us not be slow to do so. What we have in this book is the history of the world written by God himself. It doesn't contain every element of everything that's occurred from the creation to the culmination in eternity but only the things that God felt we needed to know to progress us to that eternity. The most important aspects of history recorded by God himself, the ultimate historian, telling us everything we need to know for life now and life and eternity to come. One message throughout the entire book Genesis to Revelation. Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, has come to live among men, to die for their sins and to rise from the grave, securing forever a place in his eternal kingdom to come. From every page, this history screams out, Jesus Christ is Lord. He has defeated the sin of the world and invites all to repent and believe, all to receive from him freedom from sin and eternal life. All who will hear are welcome to come. That is a consistent message. What what do we do with this message? Will we scoff and reject it? Turn from the love of God and the peace offered 
in his resurrection? Will you hear this message this morning? Turn from sin and trust in the risen one to raise your life out of sin and death, out of the chaos and turmoil into his peace and his love and his grace forever. Or will you just wonder and look deeper into what these things say? And if that's you, I I encourage you, do that. That's an honest, that's an honest answer. You're not ready to believe that. That's a hard message. Maybe you're not ready. But search to see if these things are true, and I would love to have that conversation with you. Call me, email me, stop me after this service, anytime, any day. I'd love to talk to you more about what Jesus says in this book about himself. Maybe this message is a joy to hear as you've known the Lord for years, but maybe this is that opportunity for you to truly commit to living as witnesses that this message calls us to. To being those that continue to move the resurrection forward in this world. To be the ones that proclaim the grace to all nations. No matter what the response, we all stand as witnesses of these things with the power of God within us and the word of God in our hands. The resurrection brings new life to all belief. What joy to be witnesses of the glories of God's resurrection power. What joy. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, it is joy. It is all joy to have your words, to read your history, to know ourselves, and to know you better than anyone else on the earth. We have a privilege of being able to hear from you each Sunday. We have the privilege of being called your own. And there's joy in that. There's hope and there's grace and there's mercy in that. I pray for all those in attendance here that wherever we are along this spectrum, from rejection to wonder to celebration, that you'd be moving and working among us, building us, calling us forward into a deeper relationship with you and a greater joy in spreading that message, that message that you've proclaimed so many years right here and the gift we have in in your word. Put it in our mouths, put it in our hearts, put it on our tongues, the joy of hope of Christ, risen from the dead, sin forgiven, eternal life at hand, and hope and provision for today. Praise you, Father. Thank you in Christ's name.